Uh, so if you got a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Looks like we have one in front here. Heather, we'll get the panel situated. Um, I know that drugs are a huge thing, but uh, North Dakota is also really known for alcohol. And I, um, I guess I'm confused because I think 90, not, probably 5% of the teenage kids uh, are dying from drinking and driving and uh, things like that. And we're e it, we can easily get to it because our parents are old enough. So I don't, I'm not sure why, um, I guess drugs are more important than alcohol. I mean, I think that it's, uh, they're both pretty uh, easily, to kill kids, which, very sadly, but I just want to know what your guys' thoughts are on that. Um, well, we, when we talk about drugs and everything else, alcohol is actually included in drug, with the drug talk, different things like that. I know there wasn't specific examples put on that, but anytime we speak to the students at the school levels, different things like that, uh, that we are addressing with even tobacco, alcohol, major drugs, different things like that. So we try to cover everything with that. And unfortunately, some students do choose to um, abuse all sorts of different drugs, alcohol included in that. I think the one thing that I do want to point out about alcohol too, just that a lot of people don't necessarily realize is, I agree, alcohol is still a huge problem in our community. and. I think like the trainers even said, it's, it's, it's in, in most ad adults' homes, um, so it's easily accessible. Um, we do still see the drunk driving crashes, which is a um, number one um, killer of um, adolescents is you know, motor vehicle, and those are involved too. Um, overdose deaths of um, alcohol are becoming um, more predominant because adolescents are drinking and using marijuana at the same time. One of the reasons why um, the medicinal people talk about medical marijuana for chemotherapy patients is because it makes them not nauseous. So if you mix marijuana and alcohol, what do you do when you drink too much alcohol? You throw up. What do you do when you smoke marijuana? It doesn't make you throw up. So you're seeing a lot more of the alcohol poisoning in regards to that. So yeah, you're right. It's still a huge problem. Question over here. Right there. We'll, we'll come back to you, okay? We have a question right over there. I don't really have a question, but I think this young girl with the first question brings up a very important topic. One of the other things I do besides serve on the Mattel Foundation is I'm a physician and a surgeon. And I can tell everybody in this audience, we lose way more people in Fargo-Moorhead in North Dakota and in the United States and the world from alcohol-related problems. That is the worst drug in terms of mortality and morbidity on the face of the planet. So make no mistake, that's a drug just as probably more lethal than all the other ones. It just, it's more socially accepted so you don't hear about it. Anybody want to say anything about that before we go to the next question? I think they're on. I just want to add to that with alcohol, one of the biggest things we can do is lock it up. You know, so it is legal for adults to have and consume. So making sure that you are putting it in places and keeping it away from your children and the adolescents in your home, because it is something like, you know, we have a lot of kids who will come in and they do fill the alcohol bottles with water because the adults never drink it and they don't know it's gone. Um, and so just making sure that you are taking those safety precautions as well. Great question right here. If it's so lethal, why is it still legal? Paging Al Capone, paging Al Capone. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of people in the government <laughs> and probably a lot of other things moving behind that. Um, I would agree exactly that it is very potent, but that's why the federal government did step in and put some regulations on it, on the potency and different things like that, um, on, on how harsh it can be and different things like that. So hopefully it doesn't harm people if it's used in moderation. But what we are finding, um, obviously people are binge drinking, they're taking more than they should, and they're subsidizing that with other drugs, like Nicole said, which doesn't allow their body to get it out. 
So we are having the overdoses, we are having the car crashes, different things like that. Uh, but then, then again, it, it, it falls to the adults to try to lock it up, to try to have those conversations. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, if you're having that conversation with your kid every time they walk out the door, that's probably not enough. Uh, it's amazing to see how many kids are getting tempted daily by different types of drugs, alcohol, um, social media stuff, different things like that. So have those conversations. Make sure you're trying to keep your kid as safe as you can. And of course, it is illegal for those under the under age, right? So um, going back to the brain development, I guess you know that would make sense on why it would be. And um, like it or don't like it, people can use it responsibly. Whereas with drugs, that'd be a different situation. Obviously, there's no responsible use of an illegal drug, but there is, uh, at least for some, a responsible use of, uh, of alcohol. Um, but unfortunately, it, uh, it too can be abused. All right, uh, where is, uh, there's, there, there is Heather, waiting for your next question. Uh, right over here, Heather, middle of the aisle on the left-hand side. While we're waiting uh, for that question, we did have one from the audience earlier, um, and it has to do with discussions that parents should be having with their children if they suspect substance abuse. The trainers made that point. Have the conversation. Stop it. Delay it. Whatever you can do. Uh, any tips, suggestions on, on what kind of conversation should go on between parent and uh, child if they suspect the abuse? Anyone? Associates. So you suspected it and you said we're going to get a drug test and find out what we're dealing with. I would even take it one step further about even drug testing even if you don't suspect it um, because it could be happening and that you're not aware of it. I really kind of live in this world of trust but verify um, with children. Um, so you can, you can believe them and you should believe them and I will say to my own kids that I do trust you but I, I need to make sure because I'm your parent and I need to protect you. Um, also, being sure that if you do find out they're using, that you get the appropriate resources for them um, and have them talk to the professionals in regards to that and being very you know, vigilant and, and um, knowing their whereabouts and, and checking on them. All right, back here, go ahead. I was just wondering if anyone would like to comment on marijuana as a gateway drug. There seems to be a debate about that, largely among people who want to legalize marijuana. I don't know that I've ever heard from the medical community, but it, you know, is it a gateway drug? Well, you know, I think that's, uh, it's definitely a hot topic when you talk to different people. I don't think maybe necessarily it, it's not for everyone, but I can tell you that 99% of the heroin addicts I talk to, meth addicts I talk to, or any other drug addict I talk to, that's the first thing that they started using was marijuana. And marijuana is not like alcohol in the fact that you can get as drunk as you want um, this weekend as you did last weekend. Marijuana, you build up a tolerance to it to where it's not doing anything for you after a while when you're uh, uh, um, using it all the time, a, a habitual user. So a lot of these people have told me, they're like, you know, I just like the feeling of getting high. I don't like the feeling of getting drunk. But after a while, marijuana didn't do that for me anymore, and I like that feeling of getting high, so I switched to something else. Now, is every person that, can, that uses marijuana gonna go to a harder drug? No. And is it technically a gateway drug? I mean, is there scientific evidence for that? I don't know, but I can tell you that the large portion of addicts I talk to on harder drugs, 99% of them say that's the first thing I started using was marijuana. I liked the way that felt, and I, I graduated from that. When I think when we talk about like the when I talked about like the adolescent brain development too, because the longer you delay the usage, the less likely it probably becomes a gateway drug, because when you do begin using, your body likes it so much when you're a kid that you're chasing that feeling, and when you become older and you don't get that feeling anymore from marijuana, you will chase something that'll get that for you. So you just keep going after that high. And that high is never as awesome as it was, you know, like when they were younger. And so they just kind of just keep chasing that. All right, any other questions? Heather's in the back there, so um, just raise your hand and 
You'll be asking your question in a second. I come all the way back down up front here. All right. Who had a question here? We saw a hand. Okay, right there. Um, I was wondering, um, kids, probably 65% of the kids that do drugs or alcohol, they haven't had much love in their life or, uh, uh, or haven't been, they've been stressed or something. I remember when I was in fifth grade, I got into alcohol because I had a lot of stuff going on. And I was wondering, like, can, like, coming home and have to take a drug test every day, like that's stressful and like you gotta do a lot of things. Like when kids get stressed, like speaking as a kid, we will do anything to let go of that. And some kids have been having talks with parents, but a lot of kids don't have that and don't have love. They go home to a lot of people that they don't, they wouldn't love to go home to. Uh, so it can be hard for a lot of kids, and what do you guys recommend on that? I got this. Um, so I think the biggest thing is finding one supportive adult. Um, so, you know, within your community, whether that's a school counselor, whether that's a teacher, um, if it's parents, I mean, that would be great, or family members. But if you have one supported adult that you can go to to kind of talk to about how you're feeling, what's going on in your life, and what your stressors are, that will be really helpful. And I think as parents, one of the things that we can do is try to build that support network for our youth. So it's impossible for us to be available 24 hours a day, but how do we help build so that they have other people in their life that they can go to if they're struggling as well? And then also having those conversations that, you know, you are going to be stressed out. How do you slow down and think through those situations? So kind of, again, having a game plan for how do we manage some of those. All right, right back there. Go ahead. I'd like to figure out um, uh, your philosophy on rehab. I know that I read some stuff on heroin that is it better cold turkey or is it some of the clinics that are toning addicts down by giving them less and less amount? Does that work? I think there probably are instances where it does help. I mean, there has been success stories with those clinics um, for sure. But those clinics also, at the same time, create a black market. Um, we, at times, buy Suboxone and um, those other drugs, just like we're buying heroin on the black market. We'll, we'll buy those from from people that are getting it, and then they're and they're selling it themselves. Um, yeah, no doubt that they're trying to support their addiction. Um, I. I I've read some things. I've talked to some people where I've say it's say it, that it has helped. Um, speaking on personal experience, I guess you know my my experience with it has been that um, you know that some of that is those drugs from those rehab centers or the that, that you're talking about. They do get diverted into the black market, but I think they're you know it does help some people. I, uh, as far as what majority. Is is uh, whether it's helping the majority or hurting the majority, I, I don't know. I'm just saying that th that's what I have seen from that, but I think that it, it has had some successes. I think from a treatment perspective, you know, not all clinics are created equally, so making sure that you're doing your research. Um, it's really important if you are gonna do medication-assisted recovery that you do that with a recovery program. Um, so getting treatment in conjunction to doing um, the clinic check-ins and that kind of thing is also vital. And as, as far as, you know, like we talk about a lot of things being locked up, different things like that, and, and I would exactly agree depending on the clinic. Uh, when I was working the streets before I became an SRO, in one night, I had two 15-year-old females overdose on methadone that they would commonly give to meth users to wean them off. So if people aren't being responsible with that stuff, it's going to lead and fall into the other hands of the youth that we're trying to protect. All right. Question back here. Go ahead. I was going to ask the school officials, um, our drug usage and alcohol usage is flatline, maybe static, maybe tick down a little bit. but the addiction itself, as counselors, teachers, principals, do you feel addiction may be up in the upper rise with our students, or, or is that flatlined and down also, the actual addiction? Do 
Don't all talk at once. <laughs> there you go. Okay, hi, I'm Pam Cronin, principal at Cheyenne, and I, I don't know if it's addiction as much as mental health. We see so much mental health problems in the school, and I know the young lady down here mentioned that as well. There's a lot of stressors on our students, and, uh, and some don't have that one adult to turn to, so they do turn to drugs. So is it a mental health problem or a drug problem that's often difficult to weigh? And I think the message we want to give to kids is there are counselors in the school. There is somebody to go to. And what you share with them is confidential. And they will help you and help, you know, encourage you to find that one adult that you can go to and to get help in the community. So is it addiction? Is it mental health? It's really hard to say at this young age. And I don't, I'll let you kind of speak to that as a counselor. Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking that I don't, I don't know if the, um, reasons that people are using have changed much. I think the access to things is, is what's more alarming is our students have the world at their fingertips and we're very mindful that as adults we're at least five beats behind in terms of technology and what they're using. Um, but I think the underlying reasons why kids use are the, are the same. You know, they're, they're experimenting, they feel like they're invincible and they might be trying to avoid or escape some bigger, harder feelings like um, Dr. Cronin was saying um, in terms of mental health. So we're certainly trying to be more um, systematic and um, in helping support our kids with those mental health issues and wrapping them in the services that they need. All right, perfect, sounds good. Another question way in the back, go ahead. I have a question specifically to weight loss surgery. Um, if anybody has any education or understanding on um, the advancement of addictions and how it affects them after surgery. Um, there has been some research specifically with alcohol, I believe, um, that because the reduction um, due to those surgery impacts the stomach size, that it does result in, at times, an increased tendency towards addiction. Um, my understanding in my, I guess, my knowledge of it is specific to alcohol. All right, thank you. Raise your hand if you've been any other questions for the panel. We have one down in the middle here, gentleman in the red shirt. We have about uh, seven minutes left, so if you got any questions, don't leave them on the table. Go ahead. It would drive me crazy if I didn't hear from the two people I haven't heard from yet. Both Leah and Heather are really smart, and I would love to hear their perspective on anything that's happened tonight. <laughs> How's that for a great compliment for our panelists? Thank you, Mark. Um, my name is Leah and I teach health uh, here at West Fargo High School. Um, I think one thing that's important to know about schools, school health, um, in terms of the classroom, is that um, it's not, I, I don't think it's what maybe all of you experienced when you were in high school. It's um, not just content anymore, it's a lot of skill-based education. So we are giving kids the content and we are educating them about what happens to their bodies and I loved that Nicole talked about brain development because that's actually where we start at the start of the semester and for all the kids that are in here now they actually believe me um, but uh, but it's a lot more it's a lot more skills based and what I mean by that is it's um, talking about decision making it's talking about what are your goals and what are you willing to risk um, by using some of those substances how can you advocate for yourself or for a friend what kind of refusal skills are going to work for you um, so yes, we're, we're educating on content and the dangers, but we really want to focus more on how do you get away from it, how do you get out of it, and how do you just prevent it altogether? Did you have a specific question? I missed it. No? Okay. Well, my name is Heather Carr. I'm a student wellness facilitator here at all secondary schools in West Fargo, so all four. Um, what I do is I work with kids that have mental health disorders, so the um, referrals that I get come to me by way of either counselor or administrator, um, some other social workers sometimes refer, or um, school psychologists, and the kids that I work with have been identified by one of those three entities as needing mental health supports. So I meet with the student, um, I meet with the families, and we 
Uh, like Dr. Odenheide was saying, we work together, we come up with a plan to wrap the child in services if they don't already have them. Um, how I kind of come into play in addiction is I think we've kind of all established that, that there's so many um, things that go hand in hand, addiction and mental health go hand in hand, and what causes what, you know, chicken or egg type thing. Um, but a lot of the symptomology is the same. Um, and I would like to think, kind of going on uh, Dr. Burgett's question again, is if the earlier that we intervene, the better. Um, so right now I'm at the secondary level, but I have worked at the primary level. And again, mental health is our focus. Um, and I think that the earlier and the quicker we intervene and, and address those risk factors that you were talking about, I think um, the better off kids will be in the long run. So. Tell you what we'll do in a, with our final uh, minutes here. We'll go down the line to have each of you sort of give a final word on uh, maybe a takeaway from uh, tonight or any uh, final thoughts for the uh, for the audience, if you would. Sure. Um, I guess one of the topics that didn't come up a lot was the vaping and the rise that we're seeing in the school. I think if you would ask me, what are we seeing the most of right now? It is students vaping, and a co big concern that we have with that is that it's not regulated. So students are buying the juice that they use in the vapes off of, the, off of friends, off of whoever. They have no clue where it's coming from or what is in there. I know NDSU did a study um, on the vape juices that are just in our community, and they have triple the amount of nicotine that's in a cigarette. So talk about getting students addicted quickly. So uh, that's a big concern that I have, and where is that going to lead? And hopefully the FDA will step in and start helping us to regulate that for students. I'm a counselor, so I love communication, and your, your message stuck out to me. I think if there's one takeaway um, for kids and for the adults in the room, it's, um, you know, as a parent, talk to your kids about those three to five other adults in their life that if they don't want to talk to you, you're okay with them talking to someone else. You want them to have that wide network of support. And then for the youth in the room, too, to think, you know, who are those people, like um, it was already mentioned, that you can talk to about how you're feeling and what you need, and, um, and parents just talking about, there's a lot of shame and um, vulnerability that comes in admitting and asking for help, and um, so we would just really want to support students when they finally open up and ask for that um, and get them the help and maybe delay some consequences and get them connected to the resources that they need. Um, one takeaway, just like for parents in the room, is just listen. Just really, really, truly listen to what your kids are saying. They will drop you all kinds of hints um, as to what's going on. Um, if they're young enough and you're still involved in carpools, turn the radio down, pretend you're not listening, and just listen to what they're talking about. You'll, you'll catch up on a lot of cues and have those uncomfortable conversations. You have to be willing to talk about it. If you're not willing to talk about it, find somebody who is. Um, I'm the annoying mom who's all parents don't want to talk about things, so I will talk to a minivan full of boys to baseball, and the topic of the day will be marijuana just for fun. Um, so find somebody who will talk to your kids and be sure that you have these open discussions. And again, I think Mary Beth said it, but you know, you're not their friend, you're their parent. Um, and so be sure that you always remember that. Uh, I'm in my ninth year as an SRO. I was at the middle school level for a while and then been at the high school level for the last five years. And uh, the one thing I really do notice, it, it might not be your child, that is having the issue or something like that. But so when you talk to your child, let them know it's okay to help their friend and to get their friend either to talk to you or another adult and lead them down that path so that can open up the doors to get any child to somebody that they can get help from. Um, I guess for me, the biggest thing that I want parents to take away is that there are resources available to help having these conversations, too. Um, so there are a lot of handouts to kind of outside the door from Parents Lead, and it is a website that is has free resources, um, kind of how do I talk to my teen about marijuana? How do I talk to him about opiates? What should I look for with opiates? Um, and so it's a really user-friendly website that has a ton of awesome resources for parents and just getting that conversation started. There earlier you can start it the better you know most kids start experimenting with substances in middle school or sooner so having those conversations as early as you can even if you feel like you might be on the verge of too soon um, 
is better. You know, letting them know that these things are out there so they can come up with that plan and then using the resources that are available too is great. Um, I am a parent, but I don't have middle school or high school level kids yet. Um, and I'm scared actually for that day. Um, but I do have seven year olds and um, whether you agree with me or not, I'm pretty blunt and matter of fact with my kids. Um, and so my son already knows and fears alcohol. That was not my plan for him to fear it, but he's scared. Um, and the reason for that, or the reason why he even knows about it is because we talk about it. Um, and I think kind of to echo what you just said, starting to talk about these things sooner rather than later and talk about them before you suspect a problem. Because when you suspect the problem, it might be too late, but it's also going to be awkward. And um, I don't know that you're gonna get as maybe as honest of a response if they're feeling like it's awkward and you're feeling like it's awkward. So um, when I teach, I teach mostly ninth graders, um, but the, and I taught middle school before as well, but kids will tell us we needed this in sixth grade, we needed this in fifth grade, and that scares me as an adult. Um, because it's not like, that's not what it was for us. Um, so just start talking to your kids about it before it's even a problem. So I don't um, work usually with this uh, age group that we're talking about here tonight. I'm actually learning a few things myself. The, the biggest thing that I would say as a takeaway is get at them young. If you think there's a problem, um, don't just brush it off and hope that it's gonna work itself out. Get get some help, intervene. If you don't know how to do that, there's plenty of people here that you can talk to to get some resources to figure something out um, and hope that you put them down a different path um, by intervening as opposed to going down the wrong path. Um, because when it gets to, if they get to the point where they're dealing with me, that's it, it, it's not good and it's by that point, it's usually too late. So uh, do what you can as young as you can with these kids to to try to keep them on the right path. There's some great information here tonight, some great tools, and I, I can't help but think uh, if we're all listening intently to some of these great resources, there's things we can all pull away and, and use uh, in our own circles and ultimately, hopefully, uh, change a life, save a life, and, uh, and uh, you know, ha have that uncomfortable conversation and uh, be emboldened a little bit from what everything uh, we heard today. A great resource here that will uh, remain on, uh, by the way, because uh, tonight's uh, event was broadcast on AM 1100 The Flag. Also will be archived on the uh, website of AM 1100 The Flag and uh, same thing on the Facebook page. So all of it uh, tonight will be there and will remain there. If you want to tell somebody who couldn't make it or you thought, oh, I wish they'd have been here, just let them know about that. Uh, Beth Sleddy and the uh, West Fargo School District have provided great leadership to have these forms. This is the second of four. Uh, mental health and uh, social media ones coming up in uh, 2019. So stay close for that. Uh, partnering as well with the uh, West Fargo uh, Police Department. So uh, to Assistant Chief Boyer and uh, to Chief Yonke, who remains in our prayers as we hope he uh, uh, is on the mend soon. Uh, we thank you all uh, very much for coming today to, to uh, take part of this event. Thanks a lot.